<laughs> Oops. All right. So this is one of my favorite topics of all time. Uh, we're going to talk about black holes. And uh, for if you're taking this course in the summer of 2020, um, this online course, this is the first time I'm actually implementing some of this material into this particular course. Um, so we're going to go on a pretty wild physics ride here. I want to start with my favorite astronomical image of the last few years, uh, which is the first ever image of the region around black hole. So black holes are these weird theoretical construct um, that also turn out to exist. Uh, we'll talk about near the end how we figured they existed, um, but we had never seen one. Um, and in fact, if you've ever heard of, you know, what a black hole is, you know that uh, light cannot, that goes in cannot escape. So technically we don't see the black hole itself, but we would see what's happening around it. Um, and this image taken with um, a radio telescope, radio interferometer called the Event Horizon Telescope, um, was the first ever image of uh, the region around a black hole. So the black holes at the center, there's no light coming from the center because that, that's the black hole that it's not giving off any light. Um, but what we see happening around it um, is, is interesting and it's stuff that's giving off radio waves and it tells us what's happening there. It matches really well to the theoretical picture of what um, models said regions around black holes would look like. Um, and also they change really rapidly. So these observations um, were made in April 2017. They were announced in April 2018. Um, and you can see down here some of the other observations leading up to that, those different bright spots. Um, the reason they were able to get this image, um, because black holes are really tiny <laughs> and often far away, so their angular size is really tiny. Um, going all the way back to telescopes takes a really big telescope to get really good angular resolution. Um, you can make a telescope about the size of the Earth <laughs> if you use a technique called interferometry. If you set up telescopes all around the Earth. Um, this works best with radio, even though radio are long wavelengths and that works against us in the angular resolution business. Um, but that's by far the, the easiest way to make an interferometer, um, particularly one the size of the Earth. And so they combined data from several different telescopes in Chile, in Hawaii, in southwestern US, Europe, I think, um, just from all over the world, uh, these telescopes, in order to get that really good angular resolution uh, and sensitivity uh, to see what was happening here. Okay. So what black holes are, to understand black holes, we're going to go into uh, something called relativity. So relativity uh, is a, a theory, it's actually a couple of set of theories um, that were devised primarily by Albert Einstein near the early part of the 20th century. Um, and this really turned physics on its head because up until this point, um, the, the physics of motion of things tended to behave the way we thought it should. <laughs> like, you know, how you imagine things speeding up and slowing down all around the universe, you know, it was, was what was measured. Um, but there had been some work done, um, particularly around light, that um, was bringing up some, some troubling things. Special relativity starts with a postulate. Uh, that the speed of light is the same to all observers, no matter how they're moving. Why is this important? Okay, imagine there's a train, train going by, and uh, I'm on the train. So if I'm on the train and I throw a baseball, I don't even know what a normal baseball speed is, whatever it is for me, it's really slow. 30 miles an hour, really winging it for me. So say I throw a ball 30 miles an hour across the train car. I measure the speed of that ball, I measure 30 miles an hour. If you're standing on the train tracks, watching me and the ball, and the whole train going 50 miles an hour past you, you see the train going 50 miles an hour, and the ball's going 30 miles an hour within the train, 
you add those up. So you see the ball going 80 miles an hour. That uh, is how we measure things in the world for the most part. Um, but light didn't do that. Many, many experiments um, tried to figure out uh, whether there was a special reference frame um, for light. You know, where was light, the speed of light, and never changed. Like, it turned out to be no matter what they did, <laughs> no matter how they moved things, um, light always stayed the same speed. So that'd be like you measuring 30 miles an hour and me measuring 30 miles an hour for the baseball, and that doesn't happen with baseballs. Okay, so the speed of, so light's a little different from things that have mass. It always travels at the same speed no matter what. So if I'm shining a flashlight in the train car, um, yeah, so if I'm shining a flashlight from the train car and you see me and the train and the flashlight going past you, you're going to measure the light moving past you as the speed of light. So actually, this is this is apparently a flashlight going into like two flashlights, one going in each direction. Um, so as you see the train go by at time zero, time one, time two, you measure the speed of light of the light, and that tells you how far the light has traveled in that car. So over this time period, it hasn't even reached the end of the car um, for this side. It's well past the end of the car or hit the end of the car here. Now, if I am that red dot, no, no, sorry. If I'm at that gray line uh, and I'm the one who sent the flash of light from my two flashlights, I'm going to measure the speed of light as the speed of light, which is the same speed the person on the platform measures. The result of that, so in what we call my reference frame, to me, the train's not moving. I'm in the train, the mean train are moving the same. So I measure the speed of light over the same time period. So T0, 1, 2, T0, 1, 2. At T1, I see the lights partway to both ends, and T2, it's just gone past both ends. Um, that's a different result than what the person on the platform saw. OK, from this. Einstein had to reimagine space and time. So that time was not a fixed quantity the way we assume time passes and it, time is time. One second happens every second, um, no matter what you're doing. From this observation that light always travels at the same speed no matter what, he was able to draw a new theory of how space and time work where time is changeable. Uh, time can be compressed or stretched. Uh, space can be compressed or stretched. You get some really wacky things out of this. Um, but the wackiest thing of it is that you can measure it, and it's real. <laughs> this is actually happening. In fact, your GPS on your phone or whatever GPS device you're using um, would not have the accuracy it has if we didn't take into account the way space and time compress and expand as the satellite moves around the Earth, um, the GPS satellites. Like, we would not get the right answer for all of our, we would, we would be like way off. It would have you on the next block over. Um, so this sounds super weird, um, turns out it's true. Um, one thing, if, you, if you're taking the course along with the book, um, they describe the twin paradox. So if you have twin astronauts, uh, and for example, we have Mark and Scott Kelly, actual twins who are both astronauts. Um, they've not actually done this experiment, obviously. Um, but the twin paradox says that due to this effect, if you have twins that are 20 years old at Earth when this experiment starts, and the red twin <laughs> um, travels nearly the speed of light to a, what is that? to a star that is 30 light years away. So according to the green twin, they've spent 30 years going to the star and 30 years coming back. So 30 plus 30 is 60. When the red twin comes back, the green twin is uh, 80 years old. The red twin, however, 
has experienced space and time differently in their reference frame due to the fact that they're moving. And it's more obvious the faster you move. So you're ma moving close to the speed of light, there and back. According to their clocks, they've only been gone for 30 years in this particular example. So you start out with twins the same age, one goes out and back, traveling near the speed of light, comes back and is younger, significantly younger than their twin. Um, again, we haven't actually done this experiment. Uh, we can't travel 30 light years yet, but um, they've done this with atomic clocks. So clocks that have really, 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 really fine precision. So their clocks are lined up when they start and they send one off in space on a you know nice fast journey and comes back and one clock is ahead of the other. Um, in that case, the, it's, it's, you know, it could be nanoseconds. In fact, because, um, oh gosh, I forgot if it was Mark or Scott. Um, one of the twins spent like a year on the space station, so technically one of the twins is like, I don't know, some number of nanoseconds older, but you know, I guess twins don't get born at exactly the same time. Anyway, point is, this is weird, this is physically possible, and this has actually been measured. Now this only works, special relativity only describes what's happening when one reference frame is moving at a constant velocity compared to the other one. So that means the speed doesn't change and the direction doesn't change. This here, we had a direction change. Um, that's what kind of brings the paradox to light, um, but you can still use special relativity to figure out what's happening. In order to figure out what's happening more specifically, if you change the speed or the direction, um, if you change the speed or direction of, of something, you're, that means you're accelerating it. Um, you can accelerate, you know, make the speed, speed go faster, or decelerate, make the speed go slower. Either way, we can just call it positive or negative acceleration. When there's acceleration involved, things get a lot more complicated. Things get a mathematically ridiculous a lot more complicated. Um, special relativity and, and general relativity are like two totally different uh, classes. Um, but this general relativity explains what happens when you take acceleration into account. And that brings in um, some more factors. Uh, in fact, special relativity uh, actually messes with mass and energy too. We get uh, E equals MC squared, uh, which is that famous, famous equation that we talked about when we talked about fusion. Um, extending that to general relativity, you end up with a model for space-time, right? So space-time is now this four-dimensional thing that we got from special relativity. It expands and contracts and does stuff. Now it also bends. So the typical picture that you see for space-time is this flat rubber sheet Right? You put mass of Earth on it, and it causes it to like bend. This is not a perfect analogy, because space-time is four dimensions. In fact, space is three dimensions. I didn't even talk about time. Space itself is three dimensions, and this is showing a two-dimensional thing. What you really want to picture for three spatial dimensions, it's like a three-dimensional grid is this cubicle grid. But when you put the mass in there, oh, that's supposed to be rotating. That kind of, there we go. You put the mass in there, it causes it to pull in closer to where that mass is. So just like the rubber sheet is, is causing a divot, it's causing a divot in three dimension. It's like impossible for our three dimensional brains to, <laughs> to actually properly see. Um, but that bottom left um, GIF is showing you something that's a little more a little closer to reality, a little easier to picture. We really like this sheet example because it simplifies things. Um, it shows that, you know, your normal graph paper is all warped, basically. Um, so mass um, warps space-time. And what does this have to do with acceleration? Um, Earlier, there was a, we talked a little bit about acceleration due to gravity. I was in, um, actually, may not be in the video. I think it was more in some of the activities if you're taking the course. Um, but because you're sitting or standing on a planet that has a gravitational force, um, if you drop something from a certain height, it's going to accelerate the whole way down. And it's going to have the same acceleration if you ignore air resistance, no matter what you do. 
No matter what you drop, how massive it is, if you ignore air resistance, it's going to drop with the same acceleration. So acceleration is tied to gravity, um, but acceleration, you can also think of like a car accelerating, right? So from general relativity, we get the principle of equivalence. It means if you are in a completely enclosed box and you're doing experiments, say dropping a ball and measuring its acceleration, you could not tell the difference in any way whether you uh, the ball is accelerating because you're standing on, you know, the box is on a planet and it's experiencing acceleration due to gravity, or if you're, you know, in space being accelerated by some, I guess, magical hand. Usually they have a rocket, but this was the, this was the Creative Commons image I can find. Um, you can't tell the difference whether you're standing on a planet or being yanked through space. Um, you measure an acceleration, don't know which one it is. So this takes us to this, here's this blowing up this picture a bit more. Um, showing space-time is bent by mass. So mass tells space-time how to bend. It's, it's warped the sheet or warped the cube, whatever you're looking at. But space-time tells mass how to move. <laughs> so if you, yeah, if you go back to this picture of the Earth, if you imagine um, you can get a little marble rolling on this sheet at just the right speed, and it's going to circle around the Earth because of this divot here. So the mass of the Earth makes a divot in space-time. The shape of space-time tells the other mass how to move around the Earth. But that has its own mass, so it's also making its own divot in space-time. You end up going like in this recursive loop, right? Mass tells space-time how to bend, space-time tells mass how to move. The interaction of those creates what we see as gravitational forces, motion due to gravity. Okay, back to that sheet example over on the left. Um, the denser an object is, so how much density means there's a lot of mass packed into a small space. So if you imagine you have three different spheres of equal size, but like one's made of, so rubber sheet, you've got one made of cork, right? Cork's really not very dense. Um, you have one made of uh, regular wood, and then you have one made, oh, yeah, and then you have one made of iron, right? So you have, oh, I got a better one. We have cork, we have rock, and we have iron, because we know uh, metals are denser than rock, generally. So they're the same size, but different masses, different densities. The, you put the cork on the sheet and it might bend it a little. You put the rock on the sheet, it's gonna bend it more. You put the iron, the heaviest thing on the sheet, it's really gonna bend that sheet. So these denser objects, these more massive objects are going to bend space more and more. So all of these, everything that happens around here due to the fact that space-time is warped is going to be even more extreme. Eventually you get to a black hole. Black hole means essentially this uh, divot goes on forever to something, you know, goes on forever. Um, so the, to something that we call a singularity. The event horizon is a particular location at which um, if something falls in here, it doesn't matter how fast it moves, some piece of mass or light, uh, it's not gonna escape if it goes past the event horizon. So to picture a black hole, I have to actually picture a sphere, the important size that we talk about is a short styled radius. It's the size of the black hole, it depends on the mass and a bunch of constants, and that's it. So how much mass has, so for example, from the supernova example, the core of the star that's left over, if it's big enough, it'll collapse into this singularity. What happens at the singularity? There's a lot of mass, so general relativity is in play, in a really, really, really tiny, tiny space. So another branch of physics, quantum physics, is at play. Those two branches don't play nice together, <laughs> at least as far as we know. Like, physicists have not figured out entirely how to do quantum gravity. That's an active area of research. Um, so we don't entirely know what's happening in here, like the physics of what's happening. That's like uh, just one of the, the current frontiers. Um, but we do know what happens 
coming up to the event horizon. So the closer you get to this black hole, you think the divot is, is deeper, or you just think gravity is stronger. So you need a lot more speed. So if you get this close, you need to like really book it out of there to be able to get away from it. So the speed, the escape speed, gets higher and higher the closer you get. At some point, the escape speed equals the speed of light. Speed of light is the thing, so no mass that we know of can go the speed of light, and nothing we know of can go faster. So light is the fastest thing in the universe. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. So light, uh, you can get right out to just outside here, and a beam of light might be able to turn back around and go back out. Um, but once something goes past here, it'll never have, it'll never move fast enough to escape from the gravitational pull of this singularity at the center. So this is the event horizon. This is the point of no return. This is, we can think of it as the surface of a black hole. Um, weird stuff, just as weird stuff happens in special relativity when you move, uh, which is more obvious when you move closer to the speed of light, weird stuff happens in general relativity too. Um, and it's more extreme if you're near a really massive, particularly dense object like a black hole. Um, one of those things is a lovely term that we actually literally call spaghettification. This means if you, you know, if you're mean and you toss an astronaut into a black hole here, this is the stuff around a black hole. Um, the gravitational pull, if you throw them in feet first, the gravitational pull on, the, on their feet is greater than the gravitational pull on their head by a significant amount, such that it would stretch this human. <laughs> this is awful. Uh, it would stretch whatever matter you throw at it um, into this long line, this long string of, of, of bits and molecules and atoms. So as something gets near a black hole, uh, it tends to get ripped apart in this process called spaghettification. So sending something to a black hole uh, and expecting to get any data back out, probably not gonna happen because your instrument's been spaghettified. Um, in addition to that, time, there's a uh, time slows down. So if you're watching someone go into a black hole, you see uh, time slowing down for them. They don't feel time slowing down, they go into a black hole and that sucks. But you observing them, uh, if you could like watch their watch as they were being horribly spaghettified, uh, you would see their clock slow down. Um, so basically to infinity, it would like take forever to watch something fall into a black hole. Um, so that's, and then there's even more weird stuff, but that's, that's the weird stuff. Uh, that's the weird stuff that, um, it's kind of relevant here. Okay. So black holes, super weird. Weird stuff happens in them, near them, and we don't know what happens inside them, necessarily. Um, but black holes, turns out, exist. Um, once you get to a point of something bigger, something more massive than a neutron star, star can support, there's no other force we know of that can keep it from collapsing to infinity. Anything else it could stop at between neutron star and black hole is like even weirder and more unimaginable. Um, so black hole is actually the simplest explanation um, if we see something that's super, 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 super dense. So we can't see the black hole themselves. We can see the effects of the things happening around it. Typically, as it's spaghettifying the gas from, say, a nearby star, um, that gas heats up. Uh, and also forms into a disk. It doesn't all clump in. It kind of forms into a rotating disk around the black hole. Um, so it'll give off x-rays. It could give off radio waves. It can give off visible light. Um, there can be outbursts from that disk, uh, all kinds of activity coming from black holes. And that's how we're able to observe their effects um, in x-ray, radio, optical, things like that. That's when a black hole has, is actively spaghettifying or eating something. Um, there are black holes that are a few times the mass of the sun. They're called stellar mass black holes. And then there are also supermassive black holes that are millions or billions of times 
mass of the sun. As far as we know, there's no intermediate size, although that's still an area of investigation. Um, so we've seen stellar mass black holes. Those are the ones left over after supernova. And then there are these supermassive black holes. The formation, we're not entirely sure of how they formed, but they live at the center of almost every normal galaxy. I say normal galaxy, we'll talk about galaxy types later. But the Milky Way, our galaxy, has a supermassive black hole in the center. That sounds really scary, but like physically, Compared to the size of the whole galaxy, it's super, super tiny. It only affects things really close to it. In fact, scientists have been watching the orbits of stars close to this supermassive black hole for decades. And because they're so close to this massive object, they're moving very fast. And so they've been able to track whole orbits of these stars. So if you track the orbits of these stars, Ooh, we can use Kepler's law, <laughs> right? Because we can measure the angular, the, the separation, so the semi-major axis. Uh, we can measure how long it takes to go around, the period. Uh, we can figure out the mass of the thing that's inside. And the measurements are good enough to show us that it's it's several million times the mass of the sun in a an area that is so small no type of matter we can think of can exist there. So like the black hole is literally the easiest explanation. Black hole in the center of our Milky Way isn't really eating a lot of gas, um, but some galaxies have a supermassive black hole that is active. This is an example. Um, this is a huge elliptical galaxy called M87. Uh, the supermassive black hole in the center is has gas falling onto it. Um, and not all of the gas makes its way to the black hole. Some of it gets shot out in jets. Um, not all active galaxies have jets, but my favorite ones do. Um, this jet you can see in optical light, um, cause this galaxy is fairly nearby. This is actually powered by the black hole that was imaged, the first image that I showed you. Um, most of these jets are seen in radio waves. Um, the, the material that is shot out near the speed of light gives off radio waves. Um, this uh, is Cygnus A, uh, one of the brightest radio sources in the sky. The size of the galaxy that we can actually see, like all the stars and dust and stuff, fit in this little square. Um, but the jets of material, so the jets of this really fast material go way outside that uh, and eventually hit some stuff in the intergalactic medium where it slows down and makes these big lobes. Um, so these huge jets and lobes of plasma are, are um, giving off radio waves that we can map with radio telescopes, uh, specifically interferometers. Um, here's another one. This one's very different. The jets are really bright, and then it just kind of peters off as it goes further away. Um, and so these can extend over hundreds of millions of light years. Um, although we can see activity on them on short time scales. This is an older observation with an interferometer uh, from the 80s uh, where they were able to watch blobs and like literally I've used the word blob in peer-reviewed scientific papers about this. <laughs> blobs of material um, coming from the area outside the black hole. Again, the black hole itself is super, 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 super tiny in this picture. Can't even see it. Wouldn't even see it. Um, but the blobs of material coming from that central area. You can actually watch them move close to the speed of light uh, over time and track their motion um, and see how long it's been since a certain blob came out of the center. Um, this is actually, I'm pretty sure this is M87. This is the same galaxy I showed you this one. So this is a really big picture showing the whole galaxy. Zooming in on that centerpiece in the radio and then zooming in all the way on the supermassive black hole. Um, that we see there. With black holes, we can talk about one more thing. Um, so far in this series, in this course, everything I've talked about pretty much deals with light. Everything we've seen is, you know, light bouncing off the surface of a planet, light being emitted by a star, light being emitted by a gas, light being absorbed by a gas, light being emitted by a disk around a black hole. Everything we've done has come from detections we made with light. But Einstein's 
general relativity predicted another phenomenon called gravitational waves. When you have two massive, dense objects colliding, it actually sends ripples in space-time called gravitational waves. Um, and so scientists have been building instruments to detect these ripples in space-time, uh, and we're finally able to do so just within the last few years. Um, this is using a, a, a facility called LIGO. It's basically, um, it's an L shape in the ground. Um, there's like one corridor this way and one corridor this way. Um, and it actually, this is, this, is two, this is two different instruments, one in Washington, one in Louisiana. But any one of these, um, there's, you know, at a right angle to each other, these two things. So that when a grumps and they, and they bounce light back and forth across. So you know the speed of light. So you know how much time it should take to go up and down that corridor. If a gravitational wave passes through, it like compresses or stretches space time, right? So if it's compressed, then the light gets through faster and it's expanded, the light gets through slower. Um, so the timing of those light pulses tells you if there's a gravitational wave. Obviously, this is really hard to do because, you know, the Earth isn't stable. <laughs> Stuff moves. Um, but they were able to make a positive detection um, from astrophysical objects. Um, and so gravitational waves are this new way of observing the universe. Um, it's a, a term you hear a lot in our, in our field called multi-messenger astronomy, where the messengers are like light and gravitational waves. Um, means we're using more than just light to, to do astrophysics. Okay, uh, highlights from that big old section. Um, speed of light is the same to every observer. That's um, moving at a constant velocity with respect to the other one. Um, that uh, gives us really bizarre effects on space and time. So space and time don't act the way we think they should, very simply. Um, you expand that out to when something's accelerating, so its velocity is changing. You can tell the difference between acceleration due to motion and acceleration due to gravity. Um, so those are equivalent things. What you get from that is this four-dimensional space-time fabric, and it deforms in the presence of mass. Um, and then other masses come around and move according to those deformities. That's probably a typo. Deformities. Deformities. I can't spell. Um, this, oh, here we go. This brings us to um, black holes, uh, which this is, this is the best way to understand black holes. It comes out of general relativity. Um, and they are weird, um, but we have actually detected them uh, as the end products of some stars that have gone supernova. And these supermassive black holes... Um, that are in the centers of every normal-sized galaxy we look at. Finally, gravitational waves are also <laughs> a result of um, these relativity theories, uh, and they have been detected uh, for the first time just in the last several years. Okay, weird stuff cool. Uh, I will see you next time. We are going to be expanding beyond things the size of stars and heading out into some galaxies.